Good evening, everyone. Good evening and welcome to your Virginia Museum of History and Culture. Um, my name is Jamie Boskett, and I have the distinct privilege of serving as the president and CEO, and I'm thrilled to see so many familiar faces here in what is really the, uh, the largest event we've had as we've uh, come out of these challenging times. So we're just very proud and thrilled to have you all together. On behalf of our board of trustees, many of whom are, are with you this evening, we've just finished our fall board meeting just five minutes ago. Uh, they are here, and along with our staff, they would like to add their welcome and their appreciation for the wonderful support that this body, this group of members and supporters represents for this place, uh, which is absolutely critical. And of course, we're here this evening for one of the best traditions we have, which is the J. Harvey Wilkinson Jr. Lecture, uh, which almost always is the finest speakers we have of the year. No pressure. <laughs> <laughs> As most of you know, the lecture is named in memory of one of the leading figures in Virginia banking, Harvey Wilkinson. He was respected in financial circles here and well beyond the Commonwealth, but also, and especially for us, is remembered for his deep, um, his deep love and passion for history and education, which is why it's so fitting that these lectures featuring some of the most distinguished historians and writers uh, at, at, at that work today is named in his memory. And of course, the series is made possible through the generous gifts to the Historical Society by the Wilkinson family. And we're so honored that they continue through their generosity to support this place in efforts like this. Uh, and speaking of support, I, I wanna take just a moment because surely you all notice there's a little something happening here as you walked in. I'd like to take just a moment before I introduce our speaker to offer uh, my own heartfelt Thank you and appreciation to everyone in this room who's already joined us in making possible this current renovation. This, this is a culminating moment for this storied institution. We are at present, right now, live as we're here, bringing together and adding to several generations of, prog of progress and growth. We are at long last reimagining this place as if it was built as one, and built with that very important purpose of serving the people of the Commonwealth. And that's a very big deal because there's been so much great work that's happened here. This collection is second to none. The potential of this place is through the roof. And now we are shaping and amending our facilities and our programs, by the way, to do the best work possible for Virginians. This dramatic expansion is going to add some 50 or 60% more space to our galleries. That's a huge expansion to what we do. Add new community convening spaces, a brand new research library and educational facilities to go along, and so much more. This really is readying this place to begin, and this is incredible to say this out loud, readying this place to begin its third century of service for Virginia. Very few people, well, no one can say that, right? So it's all to say that this is our moment. This is our moment to take the past and inform the future. And that's what it's all about here. So thank you for everyone who's participated in that or who wants to participate in that. Tonight's member reception uh, will take place in the newly renovated Halsey Family Hall, by the way. And that's a wonderful story. The Halsey family that helped make that space possible in the 90s has now once again with a new generation of Halseys engaged to make it what it is and what you'll see tonight. And so we're thrilled to showcase that space, but what's the best part is your journey to get there. So when you leave the auditorium, the Robbins Family Forum tonight, you will pass through the Great Hall, the future Great Hall, deep in construction, but you'll be the first people to get a glimpse at what this incredible two-story atrium will be in setting the stage for an entirely new museum experience. So you're going to get a sneak peek, maybe a little dust on your shoes, but it's going to be worth it. And uh, I, I will look forward to your comments at the reception. Now, to introduce tonight's speaker, and this would be a perfect opportunity, if you would, just make sure your phone has been silenced. I'd rather you disrupt me than our wonderful speaker this evening. That's good. I see some movement. Thank you. <laughs> When George Washington became president in 1789, the United States of America was still a loose and quarrelsome confederation and tentative as a political experiment. 
Washington uh, undertook a tour of the ex-colonies to talk directly to the citizenry about his new government. In the fall of 2018, Nathaniel Philbrick embarked on his own journey to see for himself what America had become in the, in the 229 years since. Writing in a thoughtful first person about his own adventures with his wife, Melissa, and their dog, Dora, who's a real sweetheart. I was pleased to meet her. Uh, your wife is too. And I was pleased to meet her too. <laughs> his narrative reveals the country through both Washington's and his own eyes. Written at a moment when America's founding fathers are under increasing scrutiny, Travels with George, as it's titled, grapples bluntly and honestly with Washington's legacy as a man of the people, a reluctant president, and a plantation owner who held people in bondage. Our speaker tonight, Nathaniel Philbrick, earned a degree in English from Brown University and a master's in American literature from Duke. His writing has appeared pretty much everywhere, including Vanity Fair, the New York Times Book Review, the Wall Street Journal, the LA Times, the Boston Globe. He's appeared on the Today Show, the Morning Show, Dateline, PBS's American Experience, C-SPAN, NPR. He is the author of several wonderful and award-winning books and New York Times bestsellers, including In the Heart of the Sea, The Tragedy of the Whale Ship Essex. That was made into a movie, right? Mayflower, A Story of Courage, Community, and War, and a trilogy on the American Revolution consisting of Bunker Hill, Valiant Ambition, and In the Hurricane's Eye. And of course, the subject of tonight's lecture, Travels with George in Search of Washington and His Legacy. And I, I would just like to wrap up to say on a personal note, Nate visited the museum during his journey with George, as I described, and he came here. He came here to see the valuable assets of this place, and we are both humbled and proud to be referenced in this wonderful new work. If you would, please, ladies and gentlemen, join me in a very warm welcome for Nathaniel Philbrick. Well, thank you. It is really great to be here. I have to say, I, I, I live on Nantucket Island in Massachusetts, but I so look forward to coming to this institution. It really feels like coming home. When Melissa and I and Dora uh, uh, came here uh, back in the spring of 2019, uh, it was with great anticipation because you, this collection contains what was for us the Holy Grail. Uh, George Washington's Southern Di Tour Diary. It's half of the Southern Tour, but it's it's incredible. It's it's hit, it's his his very regular script on you know page after page after page. When Jamie handed it to me, it was you know with trembling hands, and I think the the closest I've come to that experience is when I was working on Mayflower, and. Uh, was able to have some time with William Bradford's of Plymouth Plantation, uh, which is in the Massachusetts State Archives. And what's amazing about documents such as that um, is that they feel like they were written two days ago. I mean, they, they, they're, the, the, these were not old, decrepit documents. These were vital in a way that really, for me, transmits the wonder of the past to the present in a way that nothing else can. That's what museums do. And so it's, for me, it's just been really neat to come here. Uh, now it's three, two years ago, and then come here now and see what progress has happened with uh, what you're doing. So, uh, my uh, thanks and congratulations to Jamie and the trustees, uh, the board for for uh, you know making such decisive steps towards turning this into an institution that will really be second to none in the South and the United States of America. Now, I have to say, before I start, I spent last night at my father's house on Cape Cod. I like to do that before I have to travel to talks because getting out of Nantucket on uh, the morning of a talk is an iffy endeavor. Uh, fog can just shut everything down. So my father lives uh, a ferry ride on Cape Cod. He's 92. He's the dissertation advisor I never had. He's a retired English professor with a specialty in American maritime literature. And uh, we, were, we went to his favorite uh, restaurant on Main Street in Hyannis, Alberto's, and he was regaling me um, about uh, Richmond. Uh, for one thing, he first came to Richmond uh, in 1950 
when he was uh, at camp, it was then known as Camp Pickett, uh, before it became Fort Pickett. Uh, during the Korean War, uh, he ended up going, he was in artillery and ended up going to Germany to, you know, in the, in the Cold War standoff. But he, he remembered very fondly coming into to Richmond. And then he said, Nat, do you know you're following in my footsteps? And I said, well, yeah, I'm going to Richmond. He said, no, I spoke at that, which was then the Virginia Historical Society in 1976. Uh, and so um, he, he wanted me to say hello to all of you. <laughs> he wishes he could be here, but hey, he's 92. Now, how did I come to write this book? I, had, I was in the process of finishing my third book about the American Revolution in the Hurricane's Eye, which is about the year of Yorktown, focusing on the naval battle uh, fought between the British and the French that really made possible uh, the victory at Yorktown. And I had spent 10 years uh, researching and writing this trilogy, two years longer than it took to fight the, the uh, revolution itself. And it had been a truly exhilarating uh, experience, digging in uh, that heavily into uh, one time, but I was getting kind of itchy. I work in my basement office on Nantucket. When I'm uh, not at the archives, I'm in my office, uh, often with Dora uh, sleeping on the couch behind me. And I, and I, living on Nantucket, you're, it's, it's 14 miles long. I grew up in that nautical center of the universe, Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. And, uh, to, to, and I had the improbable uh, teenage fascination with racing small sailboats. And uh, to, if you were a small boat sail racer on, in Pittsburgh, you had to drive. And, um, and so I, at 16, I began to car top my sunfish to a flooded uh, strip mine about an hour outside the city. And so that led to driving all over the country uh, to events all over the country. And I love the sailing and the racing, but I also love the travel. And living on Nantucket now for 35 years, you know, it takes 20 minutes to get from one end of the island to the other. Uh, when I uh, want to listen to a, an audio book, I have to take laps uh, in the car. And I just, I wanted to get out and see the country I'd been writing about. Well, it was the late innings of uh, writing in the hurricane's eye. I had a research trip to Providence, which Washington uh, v visited at in the time span I was writing about, and uh, went to the John Brown House. This is not John Brown, the abolitionist. This is John Brown, one of the founders of Brown University, whose magisterial brick mansion is now a part of the Rhode Island Historical Society. And by the way, my father uh, grew up in Providence, uh, just a few blocks from uh, the John Brown House. And I, I just stopped by to have a look, and in the back, uh, there is... John Brown's chariot, um, meticulously preserved. It's it's uh, it, it. John Brown was a big man, almost as big as apparently as as Washington. And this chariot, I couldn't believe how tiny it was. Uh, think the back seat of a VW Bug on four skinny wheels, and that's what was there. And according to Brown family tradition, in 1790, that summer the newly inaugurated President George Washington came to Providence and was given a ride in John Brown's chariot. I don't know how the two of them fit in that single seat uh, and went out to Fox Point uh, where a ship was being built uh, uh, for John Brown named for the president. Now that got me to thinking. I knew Washington had visited Providence several times as a general, but what was he doing there as president? And that led me to discover uh, that when Washington became president, uh, he realized he was the leader of an already divided country. We have not invented partisanship. Uh, the Constitution deeply divided this country at the very beginning. There were, the, there were no organized political parties, but there were the Federalists uh, uh, believed in the Constitution and the strong federal government it created the Anti-Federalists were not so certain uh, that they, they mistrusted 
the strong central government uh, that the Constitution had created. They felt that the state should retain the power that they had had under the original Articles of Confederation. And so, you know, this, this was when Washington was inaugurated in New York in April 30th, 1789, two states, North Carolina and Rhode Island, had not even ratified the Constitution. They hadn't participated in his, his election. And on top of that, there were uh, profound regional differences. Uh, when the, the governor of Virginia said, my country, he didn't mean the United States of America. He meant Virginia. And this was true in every state. How was Washington, uh, given the political divide and the regional differences, how was he going to create a sense of nationhood? Now, this was before mass media, uh, before Washington could uh, get on the TV and communicate uh, with the people out there. He decided he needed to get out of uh, the presidential mansion uh, in New York, which was located uh, right where uh, it no longer exists, but it was located where the on-ramp to the Brooklyn Bridge is now. Uh, he decided he needed to go on a road trip. He's recognized the danger of the president becoming isolated from the people. It was his job to lead. He decided he needed to go on a tour of New England. It was pointed out uh, by his cabinet members that if he was going to go on a tour of New England, he better also go on a tour of the South. And he agreed to that. But in uh, October of 1789, not even six months into his, his presidency, he departed on a tour of New England. And now, the, he, this was not traveling on Air Force One. Uh, this was traveling on a carriage only slightly bigger than the one at the John Brown house, pulled by four horses. He had an entourage of about half a dozen people, two of them um, his enslaved servants, Giles and Paris. Uh, they would uh, go from town to town, uh, all the way up to Portsmouth, New Hampshire. Uh, during a, a boat tour of the harbor, he would make it to Kittery Point, what is now Maine. It was then a part of Massachusetts. And he would go through 60 towns uh, during this, this trip, um, uh, which would take him a month. He uh, wanted to make a point that he was a man of the people. So he insisted on staying not in the, the nice homes of his rich friends. There would be no favorites on this tour. He would stay only in public taverns. Now today, when we think of a historic tavern, you know, we might think of a nice B&B &B where you get waffles in the morning. They, this was not what a public tavern was in the late 18th century. It's a good thing there wasn't TripAdvisor because um, Washington's diary is one long lament of how bad the accommodations were. You know, food, terrible. Beds, worse, is a typical comment. Um, and the roads were, were terrible. Uh, there, you know, there were times when his baggage wagon, which was following the carriage, threatened to, to, to flip over, uh, which would actually happen to Washington at one point on his way from Mount Vernon back to the presidential residence during his first first term. And you know, th so this was an arduous ordeal, particularly for a 57 year old president uh, who, who was the oldest male in his, his line ever. Um, he, he described his family as short lived. And almost immediately when he became president, uh, he had a, um, a series of medical issues, illnesses that would almost kill him. Uh, and Washington quickly realized that part of the problem was this was a man for whom travel through, for whom exercise was a part of his very soul. As a teenager, uh, he was a surveyor, um, crisscrossing Western Virginia and Western Pennsylvania, uh, uh, as a British soldier, he was doing the same thing in the revolution. He was crisscrossing the country. And uh, even as, as a retired general at Mount Vernon, uh, he was often six hours in his saddle inspecting the 8,000 acres of Mount Vernon. And so when he became president, he was suddenly in his, his uh, presidential office with the immense pressures of trying to create the office of the presidency. I think we now have a tendency to, to think of uh, Washington as so uh, committed and um, 
confident in the future that you know he just pushed forward uh, with an effortless grace. That is not the case. When you look at the record of his inauguration, he was clearly very, very reluctant. He was probably the most reluctant president we've ever had. Uh, he, he desperately did not want to serve as president, but he also realized there was no one else who could do it. And during his inauguration, uh, this was at Federal Hall in, you know, in what's now Wall Street, uh, there was a, a young girl, 15-year-old girl, Eliza, across the street on a, on a roof of a building, looking you know, almost eye level at Washington on the uh, balcony of the second story. And she recounts how when he's about to uh, take the oath of office, he suddenly staggers back and falls into a chair. This was not a scripted move. The crowd hushed. It was clear that what the the pressures of the office were overwhelming him, and you know Washington realized that uh, the divisions in this country, he might have a you know he might have a a um, a few years of grace period, but they would inevitably come back, and so he he fully recognized what a difficult job it had before him, and by going out on tour. He, he found a way to escape the pressures of office, to actually get back on his horse and, and make an impression. Because one thing Washington knew was how to make an impression, something he had become very good at after eight years of commander of the Continental Army. He quickly developed a routine uh, during the New England tour. Before coming into a large town or city, he would step out of his carriage dressed in his Revolutionary War General's outfit. And remember, Washington was a tall man, six foot six, two, perhaps four inches in height. Uh, and he would then get on his great big white horse during the Southern tour, it was Prescott, and ride down the main thoroughfare to tremendous applause. I think, you know, when we go to a political rally today, there is rock, throbbing rock music and huge screens you know, creating this great uh, enthusiasm. It all began with Washington riding in his general's outfit on his white horse down Main Street. Uh, the, the, you know, it was true political theater. And Washington was, was from the first, knew he was treading a very fine line between creating an impression that would sense, create a sense of national pride and being one of the people by staying in these taverns. And so Washington, this was a, uh, he was treading uh, this fine line throughout his tour. Now, once I learned about uh, Washington's tour, I realized this was the way, this is what I needed to do. I was going to, this is how I was going to get out of my office. I was, now one of my favorite books of all time is John Steinbeck's Travels with Charlie. Oh, it's just great. You know, Steinbeck decides to, uh, he needs to discover the meaning of America. Uh, you know, it's been 25 years since the Grapes of Wrath when he drove around the western part of America in a bakery truck, you know, discovering what was going on. He had lost touch with America. So he gets a, 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 a Ford, Ford uh, a pickup truck and with his, his standard poodle, Charlie, heads out to discover the meaning of America. And Melissa and I uh, on Nantucket had had the immense pleasure and honor uh, back in the early 1990s of meeting uh, John Steinbeck's wife, Elaine. It was a Steinbeck in the Environment conference on Nantucket. And I was just starting to write about history and literature. Um, and uh, there were all the, 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 the great John Beck John Steinbeck scholars of the country were there. And Elaine Steinbeck, who, uh, whose first year of marriage to John Steinbeck had been spent on Nantucket. Steinbeck was working on um, uh, east of Eden. They stayed in a cottage right next to Sankety Head Light. And uh, at 78, Elaine decided to come to her first uh, Steinbeck uh, conference on Nantucket so she could see the place where they spent their first summer. And uh, everybody wanted to sit next to I Elaine at the dinner that was to kick it all off. And um, 
recognizing that uh, there was a there was a, a problem there, they decided to put the two local unknowns, Melissa and I, on either side of Elaine. And so um, we spent the evening talking to Elaine Steinbeck about travels with Charlie. And as she said, John was his health was terrible. I was very concerned, but when he said he was taking Charlie, I knew he was going to be all right. So I decided it's time to uh, uh, do my John Steinbeck invitation. And uh, Melissa had just retired. Uh, she was a lawyer for 25 years. After that, 10 years, leader of a nonprofit on Nantucket. She was retired. We had a new puppy, a Nova Scotia duck tolling retriever, uh, a red a little red dog that looks a lot like a fox uh, named Dora. And so the three of us headed out and uh, retraced Washington's journey across this country. And so this book is a, a different kind of book for me. It's, and this is why I, I really looked forward to this. I, I had spent more than 20 years writing heavily researched histories of, of various events from the, the sinking of the whale ship Essex by a whale to the Mayflower to the Battle of Little Bighorn and the trilogy of the American Revolution. And I wanted to, to get at the history of this country with a more informal conversational voice. I also wanted to add some humor. I think historians can get um, uh, take themselves a little ser too seriously sometimes, particularly when it comes to the past. And there is an absurdity in life uh, that Washington was well aware of um, uh, and, you know, that anyone who lives is aware of. And that sometimes gets drained from the, the past and the present, uh, if you, so to speak. So I, I decided I, I that this book would uh, have two storylines, uh, Washington's uh, tour of, of, of the United States and our tour as we followed Washington uh, from, from, uh, from place to place. And I'd like to read um, a section uh, from our New England tour. Uh, now, Washington, when he went on his New England tour, he knew that America faced a tremendous challenge. Uh, at that point, America, even despite the fact that you know we had won the American Revolution, was still heavily dependent on British goods, uh, particularly when it came to textiles, uh, because the British were the leaders in in you know the technological breakthroughs that created the cotton mill and the woolen mill, and they jealously guarded that. It was illegal uh, to even uh, make a drawing of one of these state-of-the-art mills and uh, and take it uh, out of the country. Uh, you know, it was against the law. And so Washington realized Amer America had to have its own technological revolution. And uh, when he toured, and he realized that uh, if it was going to start, it was going to start in Massachusetts, which was already the tech capital of, of the United States. And um, there were these, these embryonic mills, and he made a point of going to all of these mills and touting uh, them as the future. And so we, we, we went to many of these, uh, uh, one place called Sturbridge Village, which is a historic town, a late 18th, early 19th century town that has several of these mills. And uh, we wanted to see the kinds of thing Washington was, 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 was touting. And at one point, uh, and this book also, there's quite a bit of the banter between uh, Melissa and 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 me, um, I have a tendency to get very enthusiastic about things, and um, my judgment is often a little clouded. Melissa is as more straightforward and uh, often asks questions that uh, uh, are are necessary for for me to to, uh, to 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 ponder. And I'd like to read uh, from chapter six, the beginning of chapter six. This is during our New England tour as we were on our way from Hartford into Springfield, Massachusetts. And one of the things Washington note, takes note in his diary. And and while we were driving, Melissa had the had the diary, uh, not the actual diary, but the the published version of it uh, spread out on her lap. And it was really kind of amazing to to drive into a town and you know stop there and read what washington had to say as as we looked looked around and one of the things i did before we even 
uh, visited or you know departed from Nantucket was you know I I I wanted we had Washington's diary, we had the addresses that uh, townspeople would would send to him and his responses. But what I really wanted to get to know were how how were how was Washington's visits remembered? You know, what, what was left of Washington's visits besides the historical plaques, besides that claim Washington slept here? Uh, Melissa and I got very sick of that term. You know, it's, it's kind of a historical joke, but it was no joke, joking matter staying at these public taverns. In two taverns during his New England tour, Washington would approach a tavern with dusk uh, night coming on and be rejected. Uh, one uh, one tour owner, uh, one the wife of one of the, uh, uh, the the tavern owners, misheard him and thought he was the president of Yale, and said uh, no, sh he couldn't stay there. She later heard that it oh no, it was the president of the United States and was very upset. But you know here he is, you know, the president of the United States, and he can't even find a place to stay. Um, but so what I, I I did was I sent out uh, queries. Uh, to the historical societies and libraries of just about every, I made a list of all the towns and cities, asking them for what information they had, including um, this museum, asking them what they had about Washington's um, visit uh, to their town or city. And pretty soon, uh, you know, all sorts of stuff started coming my way, accounts from older people uh, who, when they were eight, had seen George Washington and in their 80s recounted uh, what they remembered. Newspaper reports, uh, uh, letters, diaries. It was just a huge amount of material. And, um, you know, Tip O'Neill uh, was famous for saying, All politics is local. Well, I am here before you tonight to say, All history is local. Because here we were following uh, an event of national. Uh, proportions, but it was for me and Melissa, uh, I don't know if Dora really uh, caught on to this, but it was through the local stories uh, that suddenly Washington became, uh, Washington's visit became more alive um, uh, to us. Uh, you know, one of the things is, you know, Washington is often, you know, there's Washington on the $1 bill. You know, he stayed and remote. He doesn't seem like a backslapper, you know, someone who enjoys life. And that's true. He wasn't. And yet, by reading these accounts, we began to see a different kind of Washington, not the statesman, the general, the plantation owner, but the traveler. There's an account of um, a girl who was eight years old. Sarah was her name in Oyster Bay, Long Island, where I spoke at over the weekend. And she was standing at her, her, um, at her gate, across the street, workmen were building a one-room schoolhouse, the Bungtown Schoolhouse that would be there for more than 100 years, when suddenly she saw George Washington ride by on his horse. And uh, uh, 65, more, more than 60, 75 years later, she would recount this to a newspaper reporter when she was living in Greenwich Village. And she remembered that Washington got off his horse, and walked over to the, the, the construction workers and volunteered to help them raise a rafter onto the roof. And they got it up there, and then he led them in three cheers. You know, this was not the Washington that's on the $1 bill. This is the Washington, the traveler, enjoying himself on the road. Now, here's a, a quote from Melissa, myself, and Dora on the road. One of the reasons Melissa and I moved to Nantucket was so that Melissa wouldn't have to devote so much of her day to commuting to and from work. This was back when she was an attorney. On Nantucket, we would all be together in the same figurative boat. Then with the publication of In the Heart of the Sea in 2000, when both our kids were in high school, I embarked on my first book tour. Since then, a book tour has become an almost annual ritual. We had originally moved to Nantucket so that Melissa's job would not divide us as a family. Now it was my job that was keeping us apart for weeks at a time every year. So it came as no surprise when Melissa wondered out loud on her way to Hartford, so what was Martha doing while George toured New England? Melissa knew that what it was like to be at home when her husband was on the road. At the time, I didn't have a good answer to her question. I've since come to realize just how unhappy Martha Washington was back in New York. 
In late October, as her husband made his way across Connecticut and Massachusetts, she wrote to her niece, Fanny, I live a very dull life here and know nothing that passes in the town. This is the temporary capital of New York. Indeed, I think I am more like a state prisoner than anything else. There are certain bounds set for me, which I must not depart from. And as I cannot do as I like, I am obstinate and stay at home a great deal. In a letter to her friend, Mercy Otis Warren, in Boston, Martha explained that her most fervent wish, a wish shared by her husband, had been to grow old in solitude and tranquility together back in Mount Vernon. That said, she could not blame Washington for having acted according to his ideas of duty in obeying the voice of his country. She knew that many women, particularly younger women, would be prodigiously pleased with the splendid scenes of public life that went with being married to the president. She also knew that Washington and his staff were doing everything they could to make me as contented as possible. Despite all her misgivings and regrets, she was determined to be cheerful and to be happy in whatever situation I may be, for I have learned from experience that the greater part of our happiness or misery depends upon our dispositions and not upon our circumstances. We carry the seeds of the one or the other about with us in our minds wherever we go. Later, when I read Martha's words to Melissa, she issued one of her trademark sighs, then smiled broadly. I like her, she said. <laughs> and so we followed them across New England. Uh, and, you know, Steinbeck said, a trip, a, you don't take a trip, a trip takes you. Uh, you know, and the things we experienced, I can't go into all of them because that's why you have to read the book. Uh, I will say that uh, Washington would finally, uh, when he did his New England tour, he didn't visit Rhode Island because Rhode Island had not yet ratified the Constitution. And so he made a point of avoiding it. Uh, a, a, a year later, uh, that spring, uh, Rhode Island would ratify the Constitution. Washington, I think uh, today a politician would say, well, Rhode Island, it was the last state to come in. They are, that's enemy territory. Don't waste your time going over there. That was not Washington's attitude. Uh, on seeming the spur of the moment, he, uh, he decided to visit Newport and Providence. He would travel by schooner and sail up uh, outside Long Island, not Long Island Sound, but it was actually faster to go out and, and visit Newport and Providence. Well, we would follow, we would sail to Newport in her 38 foot y'all Phoebe, uh, not from New York, but from Nantucket. And, um, once again, I'm not going to go into the details, but we, uh, on her way would encounter none other than a tornado. Uh, known as a water spout, the most terrifying half hour I've ever experienced. But as you know, as I said to Melissa, you know, if if we if we capsize and we drown, they're all going to say at least they died doing what they love. This, uh, this I don't like this at all. <laughs> this is no way to go. Give me a morphine drip in a hospital any day. But um, uh, but but. You know, so so these were the adventures we were having, and um, eventually, you know, but Washington, when the temporary capital moved from New York to Philadelphia, it was now time for Washington's southern tour, and this was um, this was going to be different from the New England tour. By that time, the policies of his government had come into clear focus. That um, uh, that Hamilton's uh, financial plan and called for a tax on whiskey that was not uh, uh, popular in the South. It would ultimately span what is known as the Whiskey Rebellion in Western Pennsylvania, significantly a place Washington would not visit uh, during his presidential tour. Um, there, there was you know, all sorts of issues, and, and there were indications in the South that Washington was not going to get the reception he had had in New England. Uh, a former governor of North Carolina, Wiley Jones, stated that, I, I revere General Washington, but I will not allow President Washington in my home. You know, so this was going to be different. Instead of uh, being uh, uh, celebrated, he was going to have to try to change people's minds. And this was going to be, by any measure, 
uh, the most ambitious tour of them all. He would cover close to 1,800 miles. Uh, it would take him three months. He would write out a very detailed itinerary that we, he would uh, send to uh, give to the members of his cabinet, which included not only Hamilton, but Thomas Jefferson, the Secretary of State. Now, at this point, uh, they were, those two were working fine together, but the seeds of a bitter falling out were, had been planted. And, um, and, and uh, you know, the tension was rising. And it, it wouldn't be long before uh, all-out war would be declared between Washington's, these two members of Washington's cabinet. Partisanship, once again, is nothing new. Uh, and not even Washington was able to quell that the, 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 the differences of political opinion. But um, uh, so you know, he, had a diff he had a real challenge. And so he made his detailed itinerary. And he said, uh, you know, if something comes up demanding that I return, I'll, I'll send me a message and I'll be as back as quickly as I can in a month. <laughs> I mean, you know, the, 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 the scale of, uh, you know, communication was entirely different, of course, then. You know, no one had smartphones. And you know, they didn't think of it as inadequate then because they were state of the art. This is the way it was. And Washington was traveling uh, when, when Congress was in recess. There was not a lot of activity at the at the uh, nation's capital and so off he would go now um uh he he would uh you know he would he would make his way to charleston and and savannah uh he was very popular there because uh, the rice farmers were willing to pay the taxes required um, uh, to support uh, the transportation hubs that cities provided. And so they were the Federalists uh, in the South. But once he went, headed inland to Augusta and then made his way up ca to Camden, South Carolina, that had uh, been the, the, the sort of the, the headquarters of Lord Cornwallis during the Revolutionary War, and then to Charlotte and uh, to, uh, to um, and then eventually back to to Philadelphia, uh, he was encountering areas where uh, he wasn't uh, as popular. And uh, there, there was a small town in, in South Carolina that had already issued uh, a proclamation uh, that the whiskey tax was not in their best interests and was contrary to what a democracy should be about. And yet what Washington would say is everywhere he went, he would, uh, when he explained uh, what was going on, People would listen and, and he claimed, understand. And the truth of the matter is there would be objections to Washington's policies in the South, but there would not be the widespread violence that would grip uh, Western Pennsylvania. I think there was something called the Washington effect that truly had um, uh, an impact. Now, uh, as I said before, coming here to Richmond uh, was... was um, an important step for us. And, you know, of course, what's happened to the, the statues uh, in Monument Avenue uh, is a big part of this book and of all of your historic lives and, and present day lives. And, and I will leave that to um, the, the, um, the, the book for you to experience that. I will say one of the things I want, and I'm going to finish uh, with reading one final uh, uh, section that deals with his visit to Richmond. But one of the, um, one of the, uh, one, uh, um, one, one, when he came to, came here, one of the things I want, re want readers to, to appreciate is how far Washington traveled, um, not only in terms of miles across this country, but as a human being. This was someone who became a slaveholder at age 11, uh, when his father died and he inherited several enslaved workers. Uh, the revolution would change him. Uh, he befriended uh, the young idealistic uh, a French general Lafayette, who would later say that if he, if he realized by, uh, that he was helping to form a nation of slavery, he would have never lifted his sword in the cause of America. Uh, Washington would be overheard, uh, and this would be recorded by Jefferson, uh, saying that if uh, slavery, and he had come to realize that slavery was inimical to the future of the Union, and it was the concept of a Union that was Washington's pure, intense focus at the very beginning.
And um, he was overheard saying, if slavery should divide the Union, he would go with the Northern part. An extraordinary statement uh, from a Virginian. Um, uh, and yet, Washington, and Washington would be the only uh, slaveholding founding father to free his enslaved people, and yet it would be after his death. Um, and uh, even as he was drafting the will in, under which that would happen, he was actively pursuing Ona Judge, a uh, one of uh, Martha's enslaved servants who had escaped from Philadelphia to Portsmouth in search of freedom. He would um, twice make active attempts to bring her back, even as he was uh, deciding to enslave, to free his own enslaved people. Washington, like all human beings, is paradoxical. Um, he, he had come to the realization that many of the preconceptions he grew up with needed to change. That's extraordinary. That he didn't entirely leave them behind him. Uh, it does not make him unique. What is unique about Washington was that he was our first president, and he was the precedent-setting first president. And so that um, I think is absolutely important uh, uh, that when we look at Washington's contribution to this country, it is in the context of his relationship with slavery, because um, it is you know it it gets to the complex, paradoxical, uh, frustrating uh, uh, beginnings of this country. Uh, consequences we're still living with. And now I will finish by reading uh, a, a, a section um, of from Travels with George. I'll end with this. In the, uh, and I, this is after I talk about um, when um, uh, some of the the, the, the unrest uh, surrounding uh, the monuments uh, in uh, on monument the, the Confederate statues on, on Monument Avenue. In the spring of 1791, almost exactly 229 years before protesters descended on Richmond's Monument Avenue, the people of Virginia also gathered in the streets, not in anger, but in celebration. President George Washington was coming to town. Melissa and I heard the details from Jamie Boskett, president of the Virginia Museum of History and Culture in Richmond. He and his staff showed us several documents related to Washington's southern tour, starting with a diary kept by a lawyer staying in a small Virginia town on the day before the president's expected arrival. Great anxiety in the people to see General Washington, he wrote. Strange is that impulse which is felt by almost every breast to see the face of a great gentleman. The next day, the lawyer records... All crowding the way were where they expect him to pass, anxious to see the savior of their country and the object of their love. Washington was a celebrity, and he used that star power to win as much support as possible for a federal government that many Virginians were predisposed to distrust. It wasn't going to be easy in the years ahead. Just look at the growing tension in his own cabinet. But only Washington could have formed an enduring national government in a country created by a revolution. As a Southerner with the political agenda of a Northerner, he was uniquely qualified to be the leader both Federalists and Anti-Federalists could abide. It's a metaphor as tangled as the history of this country, but Washington's administration was able to hold in suspension, if only for a few years, the combustible mixture that would ultimately erupt into the two-party system. Without Washington, there would have been no pause between the upheaval of the revolution and the more measured chaos of a republic struggling to reach some kind of consensus. If either John Adams or Thomas Jefferson had been our first president, associated as they were with the extremes of the 18th century political spectrum, they would have had little chance of reaching across the Federalist-Anti-Federalist divide to form a sustainable government. As Jefferson was quick to point out, a certain amount of turmoil is essential in a free society. Protests had sparked the American Revolution, and protests would continue to define the United States as each generation has struggled to live up to the ideals set forth in the Declaration of Independence. But as Washington had come to appreciate during his first term as president, aspirations alone don't create workable change. Washington wasn't the greatest thinker of his day. We'll let Jefferson and Hamilton tussle over that crown, but he got things done. 
when Jefferson became president in 1801, he issued a memo to his department heads explaining that he was going to base the daily workflow of the executive branch along the lines established by Washington, who required his cabinet members to share their official correspondence with him. By this means, Jefferson wrote, he was always in accurate possession of all facts and proceedings in every part of the Union and to whatsoever department they related. He formed a central point for the different branches, preserved a unity of object and action among them, exercised that participation in the gestation of affairs, which his office made incumbent on him and met himself the due responsibility for whatever was done. Whether it was in his presidential mansion or on the road, Washington was in constant search of all facts and proceedings in every part of the Union. This is a leader working incredibly hard to build something to withstand the test of time. Thank you very much. Now... People, uh, if you uh, want to ask some questions, I'll be happy to try to answer them. There are microphones ready. Uh, so if you want to ask a question, raise your hand and a microphone will come your way. I know Washington had his own carriage because he went to uh, the Constitutional Convention with it, with the four slaves. Did he have to use the same carriage when he did your trip, or did the government supply him with one? Yeah, um, the issue of Washington's carriage, it's a very good question. He, uh, he used different carriages for, for basically every leg of this tour. Uh, I, the, the first tour, we first part we followed was his journey from Mount Vernon to the temporary capital of New York, uh, which was the state carriage uh, in which he, he traveled with three others. Uh, but there was, according to several accounts, his New England tour was in a carriage, uh, an uncovered carriage, uh, which uh, can you imagine uh, in October and November uh, traveling, but he was making a point, you know, I am, you know, I am not fancy here. Uh, by the Southern tour, however, he knew he had a, you know, a real uh, ordeal ahead of him, particularly when it came to the Southern Sun. And he was traveling in, in late spring. He had a specially built carriage. Um, it was a light, lighter carriage than he had had because the big, big challenge in the South were the roads. Uh, they were by far the worst he was going to encounter. The sand um, or the red clay uh, made, made it really tough on the horses. And so he knew he ne needed a lighter carriage. He called it his chariot, but it was technically a carriage because it had both a forward and rear facing uh, uh, seat. Uh, it was painted a cream color. Uh, it was much uh, less ornate than the one he had in Philadelphia, which was full of all sorts of uh, crests and things like that. Uh, but, it, you know, this was basic transportation, uh, but absolutely state of the art. Um, it was uh, light and, and, and would, would get through, you know, close to 2,000 miles of travel with absolutely no problems, which was absolutely incredible. Uh, Washington was very proud of this carriage. There is a carriage at Mount Vernon, which is not that carriage. Uh, the carriage at Mount Vernon uh, was probably owned by Washington at one point. It would become the, the, the possession of the Powell family and through which it would ultimately end up at Mount Vernon. What would happen to Washington, the, the carriage that Washington did his Southern tour? It would go to, it would be sold at auction uh, by Washi Custis, uh, his adopted uh, grandson. Uh, a minister would purchase it. And ultimately, and it was by that point, you know, this is uh, into the 19th century. It was in terrible shape. And the minister decided to help raise funds. He would uh, sort of cut it up into uh, keepsakes. And um, and so, uh, you know, for two bucks, you can have a piece of Washington's carriage. And this rear seat, he would actually turn into a sofa in his house. Um, I don't know of anyone who knows where that sofa ended up. Man, I would like to have that in my house. But um, uh, but, you know, it's it, it, it was it was a very important piece of equipment when it came to this tour, obviously.
right here. So now people Ooh. campaign and travel on a campaign stop. He'd already been elected. What did subsequent presidents think of this? Yeah. And when did this sort of travel to bring the people together occur again? Uh, you know, other subsequent presidents, uh, particularly Jan John Adams and uh, uh, Thomas Jefferson, were not the type to head out and and hobnob with the people. Uh, John Adams, when he wasn't uh, at the, the the newly built White House, was back in Braintree trying to basically stay away from as many people as possible. He just was not that kind of person. Thomas Jefferson never went on any kind of tour, uh, nor did uh, James Madison. However, when it came to James Monroe, now remember, James R Monroe, you know, former governor of, of Virginia, he, uh, by, by Washington's second term, partisanship had reared its ugly head. You know, it's bad today. It was really bad uh, during Washington's final term. The election of 1800 uh, that would uh, take bring Jefferson to the White House was particularly ugly. Uh, and one of the Washington's uh, biggest critics was James Monroe, uh, who had served briefly as his minister to France. He <laughs> he would publish a book just slamming Washington and his presidency. That book exists. Uh, Washington got a copy. And that book exists at the Boston Athenaeum. And um, the, the marginalia is, is in it from Washington is great. You know, this man is a partisan man. You know, he's crazy. And, you know, Washington, it's, it's not wrong to say that uh, Washington cursed James Monroe on his dying breath, but it was pretty close to that. Well, hence the irony. James Monroe had served with Washington uh, during the early years of the American Revolution. Uh, he would be injured at Trenton. And he became president uh, on the other side of the War of 1812. And by that time, the Federalist Party had imploded. Uh, it, it basically ceased to exist, meaning that the Jeffersonians had triumphed. And there was no longer a partisan divide because there was no longer another political party that was really there. And so what the and so remember the White House had been burned by the British during the War of 1812. It was under construction. James Monroe's the new president. He he says a very uh, you know the, the former most partisan of partisans says as once he's president that it, the duty of a I'm paraphrasing here a duty of a president is not to lead a political party. It is to lead a nation. Uh, and what does he do? He decides to do his best George Washington imitation. He goes on a tour of America, uh, and he would. Uh, he didn't have his his you know not in his his uh, continental outfit, but he would wear uh, the 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 you know a version of that. You know he would wear you know not the the three cornered hat he had, but something more like what Napoleon had, and he would ride a horse. I mean he was he and he. He had similar crowds. Uh, uh, when it came to Boston, he was a little worried because this was a Federalist stronghold. So he decides he has to get a really good horse. So they uh, found him a horse from a circus. I mean, can you can't make this stuff up. And so he rode in to immense applause. And um, you know, and so if if um, uh, you know if imitation is the sincerest form of flattery, uh, George Washington, thirty years uh, after. Uh, his own tour had had won over uh, one of his, you know, greatest, um, you know, uh, naysayers. So, uh, but yes, yeah, so, so, and then it would begin, you know, Lincoln uh, on his way, um, you know, uh, to, to the presidency would do kind of a whistle tops, you know, this was now railroads and, and he would go to Trenton, which Washington visited and speak very eloquently about how on Washington uh, uh, fought the battle of Trenton uh, he was, you know, he was facing a challenge similar to what Lincoln was now facing. Lincoln greatly admired uh, Washington and his sense of a union because it would be the union that would lead him to issue the Emancipation Proclamation. Yes. One last question right here. Uh, this is a question about your trilogy. Uh, I was wondering what Washington's relationship was with the French general, uh, admirals and his correspondence with them. 
Yeah, the, you know, it's wash. You know, we have this image of Washington and the French being buddy buddy. You know, but you know, if if you uh, ally, military alliances are always fraught. You know, look at Montgomery and Eisenhower during World War II. You know, it's it's very difficult uh, to because two armies always have different agendas. And when it came to the Navy, it was uh, the French Navy. It was really frustrating for Washington. Washington, I think Washington was a, a strategic genius because what he, as soon as France entered, he realized the way, only way we can win this thing is if the French Navy neutralizes the advantage the British Navy has uh, uh, and allows finally our land forces to have a victory, but he could only do it with the Navy. And so he was pleading constantly uh, with Rochambeau, who was his French counterpart uh, stationed in Newport, that, that, you know, please get, tell your admirals, come support me, you know, let's do this. And Washington thought that uh, attacking uh, New York was the thing to do because the British army was dug in there. It was the only place really in America at that point where there are enough British soldiers that the a potential allied victory would end the war. And it was clear they had to end the war in, in the year 1781, where the French were going to walk away from this and Britain would eventually um, come right back. I mean, it was that dire. And so Washington had a very contentious relationship uh, with Rochambeau. Uh, they would finally see eye to eye. There's nothing like a great victory <laughs> to make people, you know, uh, see. And, and, but uh, it would, the French general, de Grasse, was, um, you know, it would be de Grasse's victory over Admiral Graves that would make possible the victory at Yorktown. But de, Gra but de Grasse uh, uh, was very frustrating from Washington's point of view. Washington instinctively understood how naval power needed to be used uh, in, in, in wor the work in concert uh, with an army. De Grasse saw it in the old way where, you know, it's the naval, it's, it's, he's going for the, the next naval victory and the heck with what's going on on land. And so you see Washington constantly pleading with him, you know, don't go off and leave us because if that happens, you know, it's all going to fold. And so it was a very difficult relationship. And ultimately just a few months later, de Grasse would suffer a, a, a terrible loss to the British called the Battle of the Saints in the Caribbean that would almost <laughs> reverse the course of the American Revolution. It was so, so dramatic. Uh, it wouldn't, uh, but it was that bad. And so, you know, it's, it's one of those things. I think, you know, we have, a, and I'll end with this, we have a tendency to look at the past as a simpler time when people knew where they were headed. No, it was not a simpler time. You know, we have the advantages of hindsight, and so things can look faded uh, from our point of view. But, you know, here we are today looking back on the past and, and many, uh, you know, some of us uh, making uh, proclamations about what should have happened. But believe me, 100 years from now, when people are looking at us, they're going to be saying, what were they thinking? You know, didn't they recognize the issues that were so important? You know, when you are in the midst of events, you are so uh, blinded by contemporary times that, you, you know, you, you, you're, you're just making it up as you go along. That's what Washington was doing. And so I think the important thing when it comes to history is to realize that conflict, is a part of the human nature. It is the essence of our past. It's the essence of today, and it will be the essence, unfortunately, of our future. That's what it is to be alive on the planet Earth. Well, thank you very much.